Hello everyone, this is Tim Koss with Jacksonville University and we are privileged today to have a conversation with one of the great businessman entrepreneurs of the last half century in this American economy, the founder and longtime chairman and CEO of Paychex, Mr. Tom Galasano. Tom, welcome. Tim, great to be here. What a pleasure. My pleasure, my pleasure. Pleasure to have you. The book, Built Not Born, fantastic, mm -hmm. number one bestseller. I wonder if we can talk a little bit about entrepreneurism because our students, of course, want to build what you built. So mm -hmm. can you help us with the difference between this a great entrepreneurial idea, like you had at Paychex back in mm -hmm. the early 70s, and then how do you build an entrepreneurial business from it? Well, first of all, it's not easy. So we should never assume that that's the case. But what happened with Paychex, we sort of did it in plateaus. My first goal was to get 300 clients in Rochester, New York, and live happily ever after. It took me four years to do that. Now, to give you a, kind of the scope of where we are today, Paychex sells 2,000 clients a week. <laughs> it took me four years to get to 300. Mm -hmm. But it's not a reflection of my sales ability, it just it was me alone. Mm -hmm. Paychex now has over 2,500 salespeople in its sales organization. Mm -hmm. So I reached that plateau, and then one day somebody came in that uh, I used to work with and said, Tom, it looks like you're going to be successful with this thing, or at least you're making it. He says, how could I get involved? And I said, well, what if we start a partnership and we go to Albany and Syracuse and uh, Buffalo, and uh, we'll go from there. And got him started. A few months later, an employee of a client walked in and said, Tom, this service is great. I'd like to go someplace and start one. I said, well, what would you have in mind? He says, Miami, Florida. I said, wow. <laughs> you know, that, was a, that was, seemed like a really great idea. So I said, uh, Chuck, um, you'd be okay with being my partner? He says, oh, I don't want to be your partner. I want to be your franchisee. I said, okay. So he went down to Miami. I got those two individuals started, one partnership, one franchisee. I said, maybe we can build a national organization this way. Then I began to solicit people. At the end of a four-year period, there was 19 of us, all but one lived in Rochester, New York, mm. and moved to various cities around the country. And we started up either as a partnership relationship, I think there were 10 or 11 of those, and six or seven franchisees. Got those going, said, this, you know, we've really done a good job here, but something's wrong. How do we walk away from this thing? You know, entrepreneurs usually don't think about that topic when they first started in their early days, but uh, it became a reality. The other thing that happened, some of my partners and franchisees were very good in sales, but poor in operations. Mm -hmm. And others were good the opposite, good in operations, but poor in sales. And we weren't doing a good job of mixing our, uh, you know, our skill set. So I got the idea, maybe we should consolidate into one company. Mm -hmm. And then... We'll put together a five-year plan. First three years, we'll grow it as fast as we can grow it. Then we'll focus on profitability for a couple of years. Then we're either going to take it public or sell it. Yeah. So I brought this idea to the group. Of course, they were flabbergasted at first. Wait a minute, you wanted me to be an entrepreneur, and now you're telling me you want me to be part of a big corporation or a bigger corporation? Well, after much debate and much consternation, we all said yes. We formed this company called Pay Paychex. Uh, that was in 1979. 1983, we went public. Uh, B.F. Hutton and Hamburg and Quist brought us a, as a public company. At the time, we had about 25,000 clients. Uh, we're doing about 25 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. Today, Paychex has grown uh, to 700,000 plus clients, and we do over $4 billion in revenue. And our market cap today, which happened to be uh, one of our high days, is uh, over 39 billion. That's fantastic, so. incredible success. And when people think about entrepreneurial steps, they think it's yeah. not risky, I suppose, to stay where they are, and it's highly risky to go into an entrepreneurial move like you made, that you made happen. And how did you look at risk then, and how would you look at it now if young people yeah. were coming to you and saying, I'm fine where I am at a big company, and I don't know if I want to take the risk to step out on my own? Well. When you talk about risk, you always weigh the potential consequences of failure or non-failure. And to me, the marketplace was so huge, and it's still huge today for paychecks, that I considered the risk minimal. In fact, if we didn't grow, we were going to lose opportunity and somebody else was going to do it. 
So I had no problem making the decision just to expand more and more cities, more and more salespeople and all that type of thing. Never was an issue with me. But then again, we did it in plateaus so that we weren't, never bet the farm, <laughs> okay? So we did it in small plateaus. We used to grow our sales force five to 7% a year uh, and expect a 70% growth in sales productivity every year. And we know if we establish that, accomplish that, that uh, incremental revenue would be profitable and our earnings would grow at a faster rate than our sales, actually right. sales growth was. And did you have some sense, uh, as young entrepreneurs watch you now and listen to you now, of wanting to control your own destiny versus leaving yeah. it up to someone else? That's why Paychex got started in the first place. Uh, I really believe that uh, going to work for somebody in many ways is more risky than having your own business. For example, you could do well in, in your company, be a star in your department, if the department doesn't do well, you're not going to do well. Or take it a step further, you could be, your department could be a star, but the division isn't, and so forth. And you never know what can happen. And you know there's an excellent example of that right here in Rochester, New York, called Eastman Kodak. Mm. It's where cradle to grave security was always on everybody's mind, and it just disappeared one day. Right. Rochester had about 62,500 employees at Kodak in 1982. And today they're down under 2,000, or whatever the case may be. So you could do well as an employee, but doesn't mean your company's going to do well, and doesn't mean your department's going to do well. Also, you can't sell your job. You cannot <laughs> sell your job. You cannot pass a job on to an heir, like a son, a daughter, a niece, a nephew. You just can't do that. So, and if you get physically or mentally disabled, you have a far better chance if you're on your own with a successful business to start with. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to these young people into becoming entrepreneurs and moving to various parts of the country to start Paychex offices, this is what I explained to them. I said, this is far more secure than going to work for somebody. Right, right. And especially in today, today's age in the 2020 era compared to 1970, Everything was security back then, mm -hmm. and today that's not true. Yeah, absolutely. So when when you think of entrepreneurs, I know people get very excited about the idea of starting their own thing. But what about the financial side, the income statement and the balance sheet and the grinding on that? I mean, you you set a pace for that. How should they be thinking about that side of it? First of all, when I talk to prospective entrepreneurs, I'm very curious about their knowledge of accounting. Mm -hmm. They should have a fairly good handle on their financial statements, their P&L statement, their balance sheet, and their cash flow. They're key. And nothing is more discouraging to me to talk to a potential entrepreneur who can't read his P&L statement and understand it. I mean, that guy or girl is in for trouble mm -hmm. uh, to begin with. So I've been a real ardent supporter. I even suggested they take accounting courses at night mm -hmm. while they're building their business, just so they could understand their financial statements. Mm -hmm. So when you hear um, someone getting something started, and sometimes they'll say it's a cash flow problem, what do oh, you really think you're seeing? I love that one. Many entrepreneurs, they put up their shingle, their sign, whatever, and uh, they have high levels of expectations of what, how they're going to sell their product, the volume of their sales volume. And many times they fall short because they always overpredict what they're able to sell. Consequently, they say, well, I have a cash flow problem. They don't have a cash flow problem, they have a sales problem. They're not selling up to their level of expectations so that they can beat their uh, expectations, their speculations on their P&L. So consequently, they go to the bank, they go to our investors and say, I have a cash flow problem, they have a sales problem. Right. Most entrepreneurs always overestimate what they're gonna sell in their early days. They think because they open up their shingle, public's gonna to come to them. It doesn't work that way. Yeah, so let's stay there because that idea, and I think you experienced it in the early days of even mm -hmm. a, a huge idea like Paychex, you, you, start the, you start the effort and then there's more resistance than you think. And you, you mm -hmm. took, took $3,000 in a credit card into one of the great corporate stories of all time. So were there slight missteps in there where you say, well, I learned that, I won't do that again, that I think young entrepreneurs could learn from? Well, actually, when I, the day I started, I had a mailing list of Rochester businesses. Uh, I had the $3,000. I sent out $3,000 worth of direct mail. And my goal was to get 60 clients from that direct piece, 
direct mailing fees. The end of a month, I had six clients. <laughs> okay. Obviously, that was very enlightening. What I did to react to, to it and respond to it, though, is I found out who the CPAs were for those six clients. And I went to them and said, I'm now offering this service to one of your clients. We have a mutual client. Do you have any other clients that are having problems with their payroll? And that's how it sort of continued to flourish. But the $3,000 in the credit cards were gone in three months. Mm -hmm. I remember I took a group of people out to dinner, gave them my American Express card. It came back in two pieces. <laughs> <laughs> and the owner of the business, the owner of the restaurant said to me, sorry, I, they made me do this. I said, well, you know, you're a client. Uh, would you mind if we just give you a credit <laughs> on your right. bill right. for my dinner tonight? And he said, yeah. But uh, it was tough going. Yeah, those early days. So over time, you've built, I want to talk about culture a little bit because you're sort of famous for it now, the culture at Paychex. Paychex is not only one of the most admired companies in the world, according to Fortune magazine, it's also one of the 100 best places to work for mm -hmm. in America, which is a source of great pride, I'm sure. But when you think of a culture, um, what are the sort of tenets you preach inside Paychex that young entrepreneurs can think of carrying with them? Well, I think... If anything created a positive attitude or culture at Paychex, it was the fact that we grew the company. When you have growth in a company, people have more opportunity. Mm -hmm. If they have more opportunity, they're happier employees. They're more successful. If you get to a situation where your growth is negative or limited, that's when the, it becomes a little bit more political, a little bit more backstabbing. I hate to use those terms, mm -hmm. but, but it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, so we always wanted to be, have an organization that continued to grow, to grow, and we wanted people to know we wanted it to be a growth organization because that created opportunity for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think that culture stays the same. We had some other concepts that I think were very important. One of them I talked about in the book is hiring attitude over skill. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, hiring is very, very important. And uh, you have to make very important decisions and very limited information sometimes and in limited time. But our attitude was to always go after good attitudes, people that wanted to work, people that were competitive. Uh, mentioned team sports. Yeah. Absolutely, team sports players are good people to have working in an organization mm -hmm. rather than golfers or tennis players. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't let Monica hear that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that was a core value, too, right. is uh, team players. Yeah. One of the things you did early on that's carried through that I think young entrepreneurs don't think about is how do you train? You know, you're a corporation that became famous for training. You made some decisions even about where to put the training in your headquarters. Can you talk about the power of training and how that led to the culture that's at Paychex today? Sure. We have to remember Paychex geographically is very dispersed. And if you want employees to have a good feeling for the company they work for, it's important that you at least bring them in to the corporate offices for some period of time, and we dedicated that time to training. Our employees are providing a very valuable service, a very technical service to employers. Employers are very concerned about their relationship with the internal revenue with the state income tax bureaus. Mm -hmm. They want a perfect product. So if you want to give a perfect product, you better have people trained to be able to do that. Uh, we bring in every new employee into the company at almost every level in the first month of employment. Mm -hmm. Now, our, when building the corporate headquarters, our architect comes up with this idea. He says, Where you, where's your training center going to be? I says, I don't know, in the back of the building someplace. Mm -hmm. He says, let's highlight it. Let's put it right in the entrance. When you walk in the front door of Paychex Corporate mm -hmm. Headquarters, you're standing in the middle of the training center. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that idea, and not only what employees would think about it, but Wall Street because we're a public company, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we thought that would be a good uh, PR thing for Wall Street. So people come in, they're right in the corporate headquarters. I walk by, I wave to them while they're in class. Sometimes I jump into class and ask them a question, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it really adds to the environment. Yeah. So that architect had a really good idea <laughs> that we took advantage of. Yeah. And, it, yeah. And, and all of the things ever written about paychecks are how consistent the employees treat each other with respect and how that goes back to training. But yeah. let me talk a little bit with you about competition. So 
young entrepreneurs, they're going to start something, they have an idea, they get out there. Sometimes the tendency is to put down those around them to mm -hmm. bring their situation up. How, how did you see the treatment of or speaking about or even recruiting from competitors as you built this company? Well, our philosophy from day one was that uh, we wanted to treat our competitors with respect because we wanted to learn from them. Mm. And learning from your competitors is a very important aspect of doing business. The more you learn about what they do, the more you can perfect or embellish your own product or service. So knowing your competition was very, very important. Secondly, I didn't want our salespeople to walk around in the public to talk to uh, potential clients and badmouth a competitor. It just doesn't sound good. It usually irritates the potential customer. They don't, they don't like to hear that stuff. So our attitude was always say good things about them. I'll tell you, I mentioned their company, ADP, Automatic Data Processing, started 25 years before we did. They are the inventor of the uh, industry, if you will. Mm -hmm. And they do a fine job, and today they're still a very fine company. Mm -hmm. And we learn from them. It, and sometimes they learn from us, not probably more the other way around. Mm -hmm. But uh, teaching salesmanship with respect to competition is very, very important. Right. So this idea of salesmanship inside of an entrepreneurial mindset, which what you did here, many people struggle to make that bridge. So when the salesman in you, the ability to read other people, the interviewing you do, are there some ways you draw a bead on somebody to see, is this someone we wanna hire? Is this someone I wanna compete with or partner with? I mean, how do you figure out what the people are like who are sitting across the table from you? Well, I'm gonna start with a very basic one, okay? And if a person comes in for an interview, sits down at my office, sits down in my office, my administrative assistant will ask the person if they'd like a cup of coffee or a glass of water, and they say yes. She brings it. They just take it from her. Don't say thank you. Mm. They drink the coffee or the water, put it on my desk. The worst thing they can do is get up and leave with it still there. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's an immediate elimination. Yeah. But manners initially are very, very important, mm -hmm. and, and we look for that. So a big part of your early career building from entrepreneurship to all this success has been kind of legendary salesman skills. So <laughs> this ability to sit in a room with someone, read them, take things in the right direction. Uh, and you're somewhat known for using a pregnant pause for some reason. Can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about the tools and techniques of that? Because young, young entrepreneurs aren't skilled in that always. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'm happy and I'm sad I put that in the book because <laughs> the concept of the pregnant pause is now being used against me <laughs> by people that I associate with. But uh, clearly, I think it's a very important part of the sales process. We want our salespeople at Paychex to make good, clear, honest presentations. Okay, uh, We don't want to mislead them in any way. We just want to give them facts, make them feel comfortable with, our, with the relationship and so forth. But you reach a point in the presentation where you want the customer to give you some indication of what they're thinking, uh, or are they ready and willing to buy at this point? So at some point, a good salesperson will just stop, relax a bit, and wait for the customer to speak. And many times, if you wait long enough, the customer may hesitate, but if you wait long enough, the customer is going to give you some indication of what, what he's thinking about. Either he may be ready to buy, and he's ready to give you a buying signal, or else he's got some objections that are real in his mind, and he's just trying to find a way to express them. So you, if you sit there and wait and be patient, and he will eventually, or they will eventually, give you some idea of what's in their mind. And that's important in the selling process. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget one of the first people I trained, the guy that went to Miami. We made a presentation in a diner, right in the owner's restaurant, sitting in a booth, people eating lunch all around us. And my, the, the franchisee, his name is Chuck. Chuck was, made a very good presentation, very detailed, but he couldn't stop talking, <laughs> okay? And I'm listening, and uh, this sales, this customer said things like, well, when could I start? And he just kept talking <laughs> over the top of this guy. So finally, uh, he didn't get the sale, believe it or not. He did get it later. But we walked out of the diner, and uh, Chuck was, boy, did I do a great job. I said, 
It was the worst sales presentation I've ever seen. The guy told you three times he's ready to buy it, and you didn't take, take mm -hmm. the word. So the pregnant pause is very important. Right. It's also very important in interviewing people, potential applicants, because, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they're a little tensed up, and if you give them a chance to say some things that they might not ordinarily say because you gave them the opportunity to say them, you'd be amazed what you could learn about right. a person. All right, that's great. Thank you for putting that in context of, you know, very high energy. Obviously, you're a person of enormous ambition and accomplishment. When young entrepreneurs are coming along, they have an idea or a couple of ideas. What kind of people, when you went to build paychecks, what were some of the attributes, you know, we think about, you know, there are people who add energy to a room and take it away. There are people who want to do great things and some who want a free ride. Kind of, What's the portfolio you think an entrepreneur should put around them to help them succeed? First of all, they better start with some level of ambition. Mm -hmm. Ambition is very, very important. And some level of dedication and uh, continual effort. I think of the many times paychecks came close to having a real difficult time almost going out of business. If it wasn't for just stick to it and keep going one foot after another. I remember in one situation we were having a very bad data processing situation and after being in the office for a week and sleeping on the floor in my office, and <laughs> I came home and my wife said to me, one foot after another, mm -hmm. just keep going. Mm -hmm. And boy, it was the best advice. Mm -hmm. So ambition, perseverance, uh, the desire to succeed. Yeah. Those are the things we look for. Okay, and so today you, um, as a major supporter and investor of new business growth and startups mm -hmm. and young entrepreneurs, are there, is there sort of a mental checklist that you, when you're meeting someone for the first time or listening to their, quote, business plan, maybe you have thoughts on business plans, but how do you, how do you make these judgments today that we can all learn from? Well, first of all, there's two concepts or two parts of a decision to invest in a company. One is the concept of the company. What is the product? What's its viability? Et cetera, et cetera. The other one is the jockey. <laughs> that we call him the jockey. Now, this is the entrepreneur. Is this the type of individual that has the wherewithal to make this thing succeed? Mm -hmm. Will he give it everything he's got? Does he have interests that are going to take him away from the, from the major topic? Uh, does he have strong family support? That's very important yes. in, in uh, new entrepreneurs. But it's these basic skills of ambition, desire to succeed, and willing to learn. I mean, when you're an entrepreneur, you're learning every day. Mm -hmm. uh, things you never thought you'd be learning about, but you are learning every day. So, and the person has to have a vision, a feeling of fairness to employees and to shareholders. If Now, we, we are shareholders when we invest in a company. Mm -hmm. We want an uh, entrepreneur that respects capital, which is our contribution, and we'll treat us fairly as the business grows. Because right. they always have opportunities, you know, to play games, uh, whether it be in perks or whatever. Uh, but we want to be treated fairly, and we're not going to invest in, a, in an entrepreneur that we don't have that feeling with. Got it. So that, that point, today we'd call them stakeholders, um, but yeah. how do you see this triangle of serve the customer, serve the employee, serve the shareholder? Because you've built an incredible business doing that. It's an infamous three-legged stool. You have, as the CEO of a company, as the entrepreneur, you got three major obligations, and you just rattled them off. First one's the client, second one's the employee, and the third one's the stakeholder, as you call them. Obviously, the employee uh, wants opportunity, career opportunity. He wants to know he's going to be compensated fairly for what he accomplishes. Uh, things that are very common to employees. The client... They want a good quality service at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. And you got to provide that. Yeah. And the shareholders, they make their investment because they expect a decent rate of return. So if you can serve all three of those masters at the same level of success and happiness for them, then you've done a good job. Right. But if you're hurting one group or one group isn't making it, something's wrong. Right. It should be changed. You know, these days, a lot of uh, people, whether they're young entrepreneurs starting or young employees rising, they get labeled uh, young leaders. They go to leadership institutes and they're part of leaders consortia and all. You've been a leader in many, many different ways. You've also been a manager. You've also been an employee early, earlier in your career. 
these days, when you're looking at the role of the leader, the entrepreneur leader versus a startup manager, how do you, how do you see those two roles as being different? Well, for the first thing I would say about that comment is I learn more by watching managers make mistakes <laughs> <laughs> or leaders make mistakes in their judgments uh, in their value sets or whatever than I ever did from reading positive things out of a book. Uh, one of the great experiences I had was before I started Paychex, I sold uh, products to entrepreneurs. So I got to see a lot of them and how they thought, how they functioned and so forth. And I learned more from watching people making mistakes than I ever learned from you know, some positive uh, book learning, for example. Mm -hmm. So I th it's a good leader, a good, uh, a good manager thinks about it, is concerned about it, he wants to do a good job with it. And so it, it either comes naturally or sometimes it's difficult. But right. that's about right. all I can say about that. Right. So a couple of years ago, you were invited back as a surprise guest to a large employee gathering. And it's a fairly legendary time. You received a standing ovation. There was an awful lot of affection of people who'd been with you for years and years and years. And they, they were feeling a concept, I'm guessing I wasn't there, of a, of a good deal for everyone, that you'd brought them along and thought about them. And so many young entrepreneurs, are, they're, they've got a great idea. They're going to run really fast and make a lot of money. And, but you've done it differently, and that's why Paychex is famous, and we know of Tom Golisano. Can you talk to us a little bit about a good deal for everyone? Sure. It's a very basic concept, and it's simple if you're buying a car, okay? You're only going to be successful if you buy a car for a price that you're happy with and the dealer's happy with, okay? If one of you overspends or undercollects and is unhappy, it's not a good deal. If it's a good deal for everybody, it works. Um, I will give you a history of one deal that we were involved in with, with uh, ADP, quality company. You heard all the nice things I said about them before, and they still hold true. But they made an offer for us. And at one point, they said, here's the amount of money you asked for, Tom. And I said, that's good. He says, but there's a hooker here. There's a catch. And that is you have to attain certain results after we acquire you for a three-year period before you get all your money. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, wait a minute, that's authority, that's responsibility without authority. I said, that's not a good deal. Mm -hmm. And we walked away from it. Now, mm -hmm. as it turns out, it was the best thing that ever happened that we walked away from it. Mm -hmm. But that's a situation where they didn't make it a good deal for us, we walked away. Same thing, if you can create an environment for your employees where they want to come to work, they, they achieve success, they're fairly compensated. It's wonderful, but it's gotta be a good situation for them. And your role is you gotta balance the three, shareholder, client, employee. Right. You say in your book, one of the things you think about it, that and these entre an entrepreneur who's been this successful uh, begins to think at some point in his career how to be remembered, how to exit gracefully and, and leave the company better than they when they created it. And then this idea of how to be remembered. And I think about thousands of people cheering for you that day. They're trying to communicate with you. How is it you feel you'll be remembered right now as someone who doesn't spend every single day in there as CEO, but is still the chairman and is the guiding light of paychecks? Well, I, I tell you, that day was a very pleasant day for me because there were about 5,000 employees in the audience. And they did give me a standing ovation when I walked in the room. And then again, when I walked out. Uh, I, Nothing can replace something like that. So I said to myself, well, if they're that happy, we must have been doing something right, and, or else the current management is telling them stories about me that aren't true. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, it was very rewarding, very satisfying, and it, and it showed all the efforts that all the management team, all the employees have put in throughout the years to have this kind of reaction, right. uh, actually on our 45th anniversary, whatever it was. Yeah. Stirring stuff. Well, on behalf of all of us at Jacksonville University, those of us who'd like to build careers like yours, and all the students who have so much to learn, Tom Galasano, on behalf of Jacksonville University, thank you for your time. Tim, it's been great. Pleasure. Anytime. Thank you.